Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I recently went to the New York Historical Society to see the exhibit Slavery in New York, and I was totally overwhelmed by the lines and the size of the crowd. Louise Mira, the Historical Society's president, has to have had something to do with that success, and I'm so glad that she's here today to talk about it. It was a stupendous exhibit. It was indeed. We, um, we had crowds practically every day of the week, and we um, actually kept the museum open seven days a week during the run of the exhibit and, um, and even added Friday evenings to accommodate the crowds. You had an ad in the, in the New York Times saying it was the most successful exhibit the Historical Society has ever had? Is in, that in the number of visitors? Is that what it meant? Um, in terms of the number of visitors, absolutely. In our 201-year history, we have never had such crowds. Uh, but we, we measured success principally in terms of the benchmarks that we set for ourselves. And we hope to, um, we hope to have had a large number of students. We actually way, way exceeded the number that we'd estimated. And uh, last count, we had about 66,000 students come through the exhibit. Were they from, uh, did people travel to New York to see it? Many people did. We had many visitors from abroad. And in fact, we had reviews of the show in all of the major cities throughout the world, Isn't which was something? extraordinary. It's incredible. Do you follow up when you're interested in students? Do you follow up with students, special programs for students? curricula, guidelines, or what for the schools? We, we do, indeed. And from the start, we planned this show to have a very large and, um, uh, we thought with our ambitions, significant component, curricular component. Right. Um, we developed a binder which had 37 profiles of early African Americans, um, some of them enslaved people, some of them not, and many, many uh, ideas for teachers to convey what's really a difficult topic to teach yeah. um, and also an unknown topic to teach. Um, we're really, really pleased because the, um, the Department of Education brought 300 principals, high school principals, to visit the exhibit um, really a couple of weeks ago and to talk about how to incorporate oh, our curricular materials into the curriculum. How do you decide how, how do you decide an exhibit? I mean, when were the plans drawn for this exhibit? Well, um, you know, I started uh, at the New York Historical Society a little bit less than two years ago, and I encountered a, you know, kind of smorgasbord of possible exhibits that had been thought about. Some work had been done on some of them. And when I looked over the array, um, to me it was really clear that the one I wanted to lay claim to was uh, an exhibit on slavery in New York. and. Um, in really uh, just about one year's time, we were able to put this exhibit together. Now, of course, we were advantaged by at least a decade of historians' great research yeah. and work on this how topic. Do you, how do you go about doing that? I mean, you, you first you, do, you pick a topic, or you people make suggestions for topics? Is it staff that makes suggestions, um, or historians, or people, anybody who... It, wants to? It's a very good, <laughs> very good and interesting um, question. In the case of this exhibition, um, my predecessor, the great historian Ken Jackson, told me that actually about four years ago, uh, he had been pitched an idea for a, an exhibition that would travel to the Historical Society on the slave trade. And um, he thought to himself as he looked over the plans, gee, if we want to do an exhibit on this topic, we should really do it ourselves, because the New York Historical Society uh, has an extraordinary repository of documents, artifacts, and, um, uh, and art on slavery in New York. Yeah. So, um, you know, so he can lay claim to having planted the seed that um, eventually became my pick. So then there's a curator. Are there historians on the staff? Um, we do have some historians on the staff. Uh, in the case of this exhibit, um, after deciding that slavery in New York was the exhibit we were going to do, I. Um, uh, with a lot of good advice from good people, uh, I assembled a team of historians, uh, people who have worked on this topic and know a lot about it. And we sat together. Uh, we had um, one lunch at the university club, and we sort of threw out some ideas on how to go forward. And two of the historians said, there's a great curator who is a um, bona fide historian of the country, knows a lot about this topic, and has worked on it, mm -hmm. uh, called Richard Rabinowitz. So I, uh, sent him an email, and, um, and we brought him on, and he did a spectacular job. Is he a New Yorker? Job. He is a New Yorker, uh -huh. born, um, bred, and still living in Brooklyn, oh, as a matter good. of fact. <laughs> so he came, and he then does the, the, puts together the research, or does the outline, and then looks for the documents, and 
picks the stories that That's absolutely correct. And um, he's now working, we're doing another show on the, really the second half of the story, right. and that's uh, exactly what he's doing. We have a, um, another great team of scholars, as we had for the first show. We meet with them regularly. Um, he has, uh, he did a number of iterations for the first show. Now I think we're on the fourth or right. fifth walkthrough yeah. already. So it, is he now on staff, or he's a consultant to the society? He's a consultant to the society, but um, he knows our collection very well. Um, does it, what makes him a historian? His training? Yes, he has. Uh, and does you he know, teach? He has taught in the past, but now he um, he does this work full time. He he loves museums, and uh, oh, that's interesting. And uh, this is what he does. Yeah, so he's considered a consultant to museums and people all over call him and talk to him about That's correct, and, but I think his, um, you know, his <laughs> life's ambitions have to have been realized um, best with, with you. Uh, yeah. with, um, so now this is really just the beginning of a whole series, although it was a big beginning. It was a big beginning. Um, we uh, Originally we thought we would deal with the topic of slavery in New York in one big show, but it quickly became apparent to us that this is a huge, huge topic. and. Um, um, it was actually my decision that we should do two shows. Uh, one, um, one show would go up through a natural cutoff point, which was mm -hmm. the date of emancipation mm -hmm. in New York, July 4th, 1827. Um, and then, um, you know, there's a different story. After slaves are freed in New York, uh, New York, in fact, becomes more and more heavily implicated in slavery in the South because cotton comes to dominate the economy. Uh. And so it's an equally unknown and equally complex story of um, you know the um, the urge to make money versus the urge to do good, which is something we struggle with even today. The date of emancipation interests me because, in a way, the celebration was the fifth of July, right? That's correct. Yeah, so that was an interesting phenomena, wasn't it? It was a very yeah. interesting decision that um, no doubt was correctly right. made by um, by Black New Yorkers themselves, who felt that if they mixed up their um, celebrations, celebrations with the July 4th celebrations that um, um, either they would be diminished or they would be overtaken by a lot of rowdy people. Yeah. So, um, so they celebrated with a huge, wonderful parade and wonderful sermons on July 5th. And we actually were hoping that one achievement of this exhibition would be to add another layer to Independence Day, especially for New Yorkers. It's so, it's, and it's a great, very relevant layer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Seems to me that it's an issue that is the basis of almost every problem we have in the world and in the country. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, it is. Let's talk a little bit about the Historical Society. It's the oldest museum in New York City, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. And it was celebrated 200th anniversary right. last year, so it's 201 years old. How does it differ from the ma other major cultural organizations in the city? Well, we're a history museum. Uh, yeah. We're a history museum with a great library, really a great library that um, has a particular niche. Uh, it's an American history collection right. um, with a particular emphasis on New York um, in that New York was the nation's first capital. And that uh, the first museum was in and this in the building, wasn't it? That our, George our Washington? Our first home the first was home the federal Hall yeah, that yeah. George Washington was inaugurated right. in, and um, we have in our collection the chair that he sat in as he was inaugurated as the nation's first president. So, um, so that's a you know that's a niche that no one else um, in the city occupies, and um, and it's very important for us because the collection can be exploited in ways that tell American history, certainly early American history through the Civil War period. Um, very uniquely. There's always been a debate in people's mind, a question in people's mind, the Museum of the City of New York and the Historical Society. What's, is, there's a difference. The Historical Society has more historical uh, information, or what is the difference? Well, um, there are, you know, in some ways complementary collections, and we, um, I, I have a very good relationship with Susan Henshaw Jones, the president That's of great. the Museum of the City of New York. Which and, didn't always happen um, between the two institutions. Well, we, you know, <laughs> we get read. along well, and um, it takes we, two women to do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, uh, we get together for lunch regularly, and we do have joint projects. Uh -huh. um, but um, there are differences, and. Um, we are not, we're not a, a local historical society or a local museum of the city of New York. Uh, our collection just is, um, is much more general. It's much more of an American history collection. Um, and certainly our museum collection 
uh, our art collection is an American, 19th century American art is really a strength. Is the Museum of the City of New York part of the major cultural institutions group? Does the city own their property? Yes. They're a, yeah. they're, they're a city funded and city owned right. institution. There is a group for, just for the readers that's called the Cultural SIG, right. the Cultural Institution Group, right. which means that does it mean that the city owns the property of all those institutions? That's correct. I think so, and that's that they correct. contribute, the city contributes on a regular basis to the maintenance of those buildings. Right, which. Um, the Historical Society does not fit into that category. No, we are an entirely private institution, and um, uh, we, we don't fit into that So category. fundraising is a major undertaking. It is indeed. It's a, uh, it's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a very important part of my job, obviously. Yeah. And, um, but it's, you know, it's a pleasurable part of my job right. because I get to tell people about the great things that we're doing. Right. So we have, you have a wonderful library and it's just, it's just a wonderful library and it feels like a wonderful mm -hmm. library when you walk in, doesn't right. it? It's it just, does. It's, it's just warm and, and nurturing and mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Now and now you have the Henry Luce. What is that? Tell us. The, um, the, what's it called? The Henry Luce. Le it's the study center study for center. American culture, and um, and it's a uh, it's all um, what's called open storage, so that uh, on view is about sixty percent of our museum collection, which is extraordinary for a museum. Um, and you can see, you know, really marvelous things. The the chair that I talked about, about that George Washington sat in, but you can also see the um, the lottery wheel that metaphorically started the draft riots in 1863, um, the bucket that DeWitt Clinton used to inaugurate the Erie Canal, um, <laughs> uh, Duncan Fife's toolkit is in our collection. It's um, it's really oh, that's so pretty amazing, and it's all on view. Which uh, is it open to everybody all the time? How do you get? It is. Um, we are a public, you know, we are open to the public. Um, our, our library is open to the public, and um, we, we welcome anyone and everyone to, to come. Um, if you want to have a private session, uh, we also arrange that. We do arrange that. Both um, the library staff accommodate special requests and the museum staff. So you're famous also for having the largest uh, collection of Audubon. Prince. Yes, we have all 435 of Audubon's original watercolors. Um, and he was a very uh, interesting man. Extremely interesting, <laughs> extremely interesting. Um, I like to think of him the um, same way I thought of Alexander Hamilton as uh, as a real, uh, you know, a, a really familiar story, especially for New Yorkers. He was an immigrant. Um, came to this country. Where did he come from? Uh, he came from Haiti. Oh. Um, his, uh, um, he was an illegitimate child. His mother died. Um, it's a very fascinating story, but he basically uh, really was an entrepreneur above all, and he had the, um, you know, <laughs> the guts and conviction that many immigrants have yeah. to, to make good. And, and he ends up in New York, so he's a New York story. <laughs> we can lay claim to him. Right, and the, but and there's special care needed to take care of his prints, which Indeed. is always fascinating. Um, the um, uh, we're very fortunate. Um, most of the watercolors in our collection, and we do have, um, you know, we do have the elephant portfolio. Yeah. Also, we do have the prints, but most of the watercolors. Well, to explain the, why it's called the elephant portfolio. Well, it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it's, uh, and we have one on display right now, as a matter of fact, um, along with 40 Audubon watercolors. The, um, the watercolors can't be exposed very much to light, and they're in very good condition, with very few exceptions. So um, we have resolved to show 40 of them every year, uh, essentially over the next 10 years. And um, in a beautiful setting, we have birdsong accompanying, um, which was carefully researched yeah. by um, a <laughs> sound artist. Um, and um, you know, so the public can view them. But um, whatever is in the show this year will be retired for the next ten years. Isn't that Won't something? be seen again for another ten years. And you have you have also uh, bird programs. I mean, this is the time of year the birds yeah. are in Central Park, isn't it? And That's right. Yeah. And we have um, you know, last year you have lots three, of public programs. We have lots of public programs, but last year three um, really terrific autobiographies uh, were published on John James Audubon, and we have been um, playing host to the writers of those biographies. Oh, that's so good, yeah. So what, what else is there to see at the museum? 
You can buy Audubon prints also, can't you? Yes. Um, we, um, you know, we've become entrepreneurial ourselves, as, um, as everyone really has to yeah. do these days, and we've entered into, uh, we've done something really unusual for us. We've allowed for the first time in, in our history for uh, specially sensitive photographs to be taken of the original watercolors. So for the first time, people can purchase Limited prints number. that are made, a very limited number of prints that are made directly from the watercolors. And there are differences between the watercolors and the prints. Yeah. Because the, the watercolors were Audubon's. Yeah. Um, his printmaker, Havel, often uh, um, made his own artistic judgments when <laughs> doing right? the prints and made some changes. Oh, yeah. That's so interesting, so you can see. So what are your prints are of the original Audubon prints? Yes, we have, uh -huh. you know, we have the prints, um, yeah. the, the prints that you can now now buy for the yeah. first time are of the original watercolors, so they're yeah. exactly as Audubon intended them. That's so interesting. It is interesting. Uh, do you constantly acquire uh, more the materials? In, yes, we do. Um, we're, um, um, I'm not going to reveal it right now, but we're in the process of negotiating a major new acquisition for the library, which hopefully will go through That's in the next couple of months, and uh -huh. we can talk about it. Um, both on the library side and on the museum side, we are uh, both on the lookout for um, uh, donations of major collections that uh, resonate with our strengths, right. um, and we, we purchase. When somebody wants to offer you something as a donation, does it have to get approved by the board? It has to get um, approved. Uh, there's an internal staff committee that reviews every offering, and um, we have a board collection committee that then reviews the, uh, um, the will of the staff, and uh, usually is pretty consistent. And are you deaccessioning? Selling? No, um, we won't be doing any deaccessioning. Um, not not under my leadership. Right. Uh, we we won't. We have a wonderful collection. I think decisions were made in the past, and um, and we're moving forward. So the financial picture for the historical society is greatly improved over fifteen years ago. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested to read the history of the society because. There was a time when they were in big trouble, and they needed, what, $5,000 to get out of that trouble? And it, historically, they even closed the museum in early days, 200 years ago or 175 years ago, because they didn't have the money. Right? And then they got some money from the state or something. Well, it's been, so actually, it's, it's been a, that kind of a history <laughs> from the start. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, even if you, um, uh, if you look back um, at the very beginning, um, you know, there are always... I think cultural institutions, I, I don't think the historical society is unique in any way. I think cultural institutions have, um, all of them in New York have had, you know, really peaks and valleys. Um, we're in a really good place now. We're, uh, we're just going up. We're not... Uh, when people learn from history, w w what is it they learn? I mean, it's interesting because it seems to me politically we don't learn too much or politicians don't learn too much about past history. And yet, obviously, it does, studying history does contribute to the overall maturity of the population, doesn't it? What, well, what do you think? Uh, I, I certainly um, personally think, and as an institution, we think that uh, there is really um, nothing of greater importance for, um, really, for the development of a human being, not only intellectual, but yeah. spiritual in every way. Um, but. Uh, learning history, um, you really, you know, you understand decisions that were taken um, in the past. Um, you understand the, uh, and it's always, you know, with hindsight, it's easier to, to do this, but you understand um, why, uh, why opinion leaders and decision makers um, came to the decisions they, they came to. Um, you also give voice to the voiceless. Um, yeah. We've done both. We did an exhibit on Alexander Hamilton, so you know was a, he was a decision maker, yeah. right, um, and an opinion leader. And we did an exhibit on, on on enslaved people in New York, which really was an example of giving voice to the voiceless. I think in both ca both cases, um, people understand a lot better how, certainly in the case of New York, um, how the city came to be what it is today, and um, yeah. Hamilton and. Um, and the enslaved people yeah. of New York had huge impacts on where we are. And I think in just in, um, in really thinking about, uh, thinking about the present, there is nothing more critical than understanding the past. I think we understand 
why people are the way they are and what the difference and divisions are and what the advantages and disadvantages of, of different public policy measures and cultural things. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that, that is really very true. Um, I think when people, um, you know, see the um, uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, the way in which New York has developed as a prosperous city, very focused on making money, um, uh, but also on doing good. Yeah. Um, I think looking back to the past and understanding um, that there was always a tension between making money <laughs> and doing good is, is helpful. Um, but I think, you know, I think we become better, uh, better people. It just puts us into the whole process of civilization, doesn't it, <laughs> also? It does. It's sort it of like does. having children. I, you know, it gives you a historic <laughs> perspective or something. I think that's true, but um, I also think, um, I, you know, I really have a lot of conviction about this, and we do as an institution, yeah. that, um, that you, you will come to a better decision if you understand the past. And, um, and you will be a better citizen if you understand the past. And I that's think that's very. I like that. That's well. Good. I think you know. I think we've. Um, you know. I think we have a lot of. Uh, I think we um, need a lot of public people to study history, <laughs> but otherwise, right. uh, everyone, everyone, <laughs> right. everyone. You are. I, I've always thought of you as a historian, but if I look at the degrees you have, they're not necessarily in history, are they? Well, you have, um, do you have two doctorates? Yeah, I did a joint. I did a <laughs> dual degree at Stanford, um, which actually focused on both literature and history. Um, and so um, that's a good comment. It's it's a very. It was yeah. a, for. I'm a medievalist, and for the medieval period, there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of blurred lines between history and literature. And I right. actually focused on a group of chronicles um, during the medieval period. And um, they were those beautiful. A lot of beautiful illuminated manuscripts oh, that I worked had the great fortune to work on. They are so um, beautiful, and there's there's yeah. nothing you know really yeah. more. But Colors. you know, um, it's yeah. uh, I, I've always been interested in how history gets told. But you also recently uh, were the what were you the executive vice president of academic affairs at the at, at CUNY. CUNY? Yes. So right here um, at CUNY. <laughs> So that added, I think, it's very interesting because it adds to your perspective and then you go to the Historical Society, it makes you much more embracing, doesn't it? Does it affect your wanting more people to come into the, the building and see your exhibits and Absolutely. have them be relevant? <laughs> Absolutely. I think I, I, learned a lot about, um, I learned a lot about how to be an open institution, um, really welcoming uh, of of people who have a broad range of interests and backgrounds, and um, I think that's what CUNY does um, superbly, and um, and has done superbly for a very long time. So, were you here when they changed the the standards of admission? I was. That's a, quite a I challenge, was. wasn't it? Um, it was, but uh, I think that um, it 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 really worked out extremely well. I don't think anyone can deny. Um, the fruits of uh, of all that labor, and I think it was very much to the good of the university. Um, yeah. University is still a wonderfully open place. Where did you come from before you came to CUNY? I was vice provost at the uh, University of Minnesota in Twin Cities. So that was quite a difference. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and what <Yeah>. happened? <laughs> Um, it's very funny because when I came, came to CUNY, everyone said, CUNY is unique. And I kept saying, no, you know, University of Minnesota is a big public institution. CUNY is not so unique. But after about six months here, it, I agree. It's unique. It's unique. <laughs> Why is it unique? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with being in New York City and being um, an institution that really has always resonated with, the, uh, um, with the, the landscape of the city and the demographics of the city. Um, so I think that makes a difference. I think the, the faculty is a um, uh, very different faculty um, and, um, you know, has a, a set of interests that are quite broad and often go outside of the university. So that's, that's pretty unique. Right. And, and so then you're bringing that philosophy to the museum and I'm delighted about that. What's your next exhibit? Well, we have a set of, um, a whole roster of exhibits for the spring. Um, I'll give you some of the highlights. We're uh, going to open um, in May, on May 5th, an exhibition which will consist of um, highlights from our portrait collection. I mean, there are um, wonderful family portraits that give you a lot of insight 
into, um, we call it group dynamics, into family dynamics. How they but stand, you mean? <laughs> how, and also what's considered a family. Yeah. Um, and the exhibit, we have um, an absolutely spectacular collection of the earliest photographs, um, daguerreotypes, and they mm. will be in that exhibit. So anyone who thinks that Diane Arbus is um, something new under the sun will look at, uh, at our collection of 19th century family uh, photographs and yeah. family portraits and um, and see and these exhibits the are of material that are in the library or in the yes, museum this is, this is, this is um, not a traveling it's not this is land. all from our own mm -hmm. collection so um, it's a great opportunity to show off on the following month in June on June 16th we open an exhibition which will be our first contemporary art exhibit ever and it's an exhibit of um, of contemporary artists mainly african-american artists who we've assembled for this show, um, who reflect on slavery, because we have an 18-month initiative around the topic yeah. of slavery. Six of the artists are um, developing installations just for this show, so oh, it's exciting. work that even I haven't seen yet. Oh, that's so great. Um, and then next uh, next fall, we'll um, tell uh, the story of New York through the Civil War and how... And um, that's where we get into big business versus common And we'll common get good. into, <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's... Um, it's a great, you know, really a great roster. Well, thank you, Louise Mira, very much for thank you. being it's the been a guest. Pleasure. And I'm so delighted that you're the president of the Historical Society. We look forward to more exciting exhibits. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.